Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 13, Hoplite Warfare. As the Greek world was progressively opened up to outside influences, new ideas and opportunities in turn influenced the individual communities in Greece as they developed into independent city-states, each with its individual system of government, fiercely loyal to its own identity and traditions. Now, in this period, there were important political, social, and economic changes, and these changes also were accompanied by changes in military tactics and equipment sometime between 725 and 650 BC. What evolved, the hoplite phalanx, completely revolutionized warfare in ancient Greece. These significant alterations in the style of fighting were adopted eventually by all Greek communities. The increase in trade and the gradual rise in disposable wealth meant that more people had access to arms and armor of better quality, and therefore more citizens could potentially contribute to the defense of the polis. This wasn't the Homeric style fighting for oneself anymore. Now the Greeks were fighting for their polis, and they were doing so in a phalanx, which was a deep-lined, defensive formation that formed a solid block and worked together as one entity, symbolic of the polis. Fighting in mass ranks was not created by the ancient Greeks, though. One of the earliest known Sumerian records, the Stele of the Vultures, appears to show the use of such a formation as early as 2500 BC. Ancient Egyptian infantry were also known to have employed similar formations. Furthermore, most scholars now believe that the phalanx evolved from an earlier looser type of mass formation, which they have labeled as proto-phalanx. It is depicted somewhat in the Iliad, but for dramatic effect, the poet concentrates on encounters between individual warrior heroes, largely ignoring the mass of soldiers who fought around them. This clouds our understanding of the actual deployment of the proto-phalanx in battle. It appears, however, that in Homer, the ranks move into spear range, hurl their short throwing spears, and then fight hand-to-hand -hand with their long swords. In any event, the principle of cohesion and the use of large groups of soldiers must have been a standard Greek tactic for centuries. Every phalanx was made up of heavily armed foot soldiers, called hoplites. The Greek word hoplites was built around the word hoplon, which was the name of the armor worn by the infantrymen. It could also denote the soldier's shield too. In hoplite warfare, the soldiers needed better protection than they had before. Thus, his defensive equipment was redesigned to be thicker and stronger and covered larger areas of the body. The panoplia, or hoplite's armor, from the Greek words pan, which means all, and hoplon, began to appear in the 8th century BC. It contained a shield, a helmet, a breastplate, and two greaves for defense, together with the sword and spear for offense. Although we know it was in use in the 8th century BC, our first evidence for it being worn as a complete set of armor comes from a Corinthian vase painting from around 650 BC, known as the Chigi vase, which shows two hoplite forces about to collide. The exact origins and nature of these military developments are much debated. For example, it may be that the hoplite weaponry was adopted piecemeal and that the phalanx emerged subsequently when the full potential of the new weapons had been realized. On the other hand, as more men became available for military service, it perhaps made more sense to make use of the bigger numbers by establishing a formation that allowed them to fight in a large group. Regardless, as the technology for weapons and armor evolved, the phalanx became progressively more compact with soldiers lining up shoulder to shoulder. As two close-packed phalanxes charged at one another, they both would collide as one immovable object met another. A phalanx typically was eight rows deep, and as wide as however many there were in the army. But the more ranks, the more effective was the phalanx. Hoplites carried a shield called an aspis. It also is referred to sometimes as hoplon, because it was the critical piece of a hoplite's armor. It was massive and round, being three feet in diameter and weighing 16 pounds, which makes it larger than all previous Greek shields to date. The shield was about one and a half inches thick, made of heavy wood and was covered with either a leather or bronze sheet, often just around the rim, 
Its heavy weight and size was made possible partly due to its dish-like shape, which allowed its rim to be supported on the shoulder. Furthermore, that the shield was also made of wood made it possible for soldiers to use it as a flotation device for crossing rivers, and its large round shape allowed it to be used for hauling the bodies of the dead from the battlefield. Probably the most famous shield decoration is that of Sparta, a capital lambda for Lacedaemon, which is another name for Sparta. From the late 5th century BC, Athenian shields commonly had an image of owls, while Theban shields were sometimes decorated with a sphinx or the club of Heracles. The revolutionary part of the shield was the grip, known as the Argive grip, since it was developed in Argos. The handle, or porpax, was placed at the right edge of the shield and was supported by a leather thong, or antilaba, at the center for the soldier to put his left forearm through in order to control it. This allowed hoplites more mobility with the shield, as well as the ability to capitalize on their offensive capabilities and better support the phalanx. Because of this, it was the key to the defense of the polis, and it was the shield that made the phalanx an effective fighting force. Such shields did not tend to survive the passage of time very well, and only one shield has survived into modern times, with sufficient preservation to allow us to determine the details of its construction. This shield is called the Bamarzo, or Vatican Shield, and it is currently located in the Vatican Museum. It was discovered in 1830, near Bamarzo in central Italy. A hoplite wore a leather-lined bronze helmet. Often the helmet was decorated with one, sometimes more horsehair crests, and possibly bronze animal horns or ears. Helmets were often painted as well. There are several forms of Greek helmets, but they all seem to have evolved from two prototypes, the Kegel and the primitive Corinthian. The Kegel type is an open-faced helmet of conical shape, sometimes with extensions at the sides to protect the cheeks or a crest holder on the top. It was the progenitor of many Greek helmets. It did not outlast the 8th century BC though. The Illyrian type helmet evolved from the Kegel type. It was used not only by the Greeks, but also the Etruscans, Scythians, and the Illyrians, for which it was misleadingly named Illyrian due to a large number of early finds coming from Illyria. However, it was originally manufactured in the northwestern Peloponnese. The Illyrian helmet had four types, as it went through an evolution from 700 to 500 BC all of which were entirely open-faced. It originally left the neck unprotected and hampered hearing. By its last phase, it eventually offered neck protection and allowed better hearing. The helmet became obsolete in most parts of Greece in the early 5th century BC. By far the most popular helmet during the archaic and early classical periods, based upon the artistic and archaeological evidence, was the Corinthian-style helmet. As its name states, it originated in Corinth. It covered the entire head. Thin slits for eyes allowed them to see, but only straight ahead, and the nose was cut out to the throat to allow them to breathe and talk. Out of combat, a hoplite would wear the helmet tipped upward for comfort. This practice gave rise to a variant form in Italy, called the Italo-Corinthian helmet, where the slits were almost closed. Since the helmet was no longer pulled over the face, but worn like a cap. A later type, known as the Hawkidian style helmet, was especially popular from the 5th century BC onward and was used extensively in southern Italy. It's a lighter and less bulky helmet and thus gives the hoplite better hearing and vision. It consists of a hemispherical dome and below that there are a pair of cheek pieces and a small nasal bar to protect the nose. The helmet is so called because it was commonly depicted on a pottery from the Euboean city of Halkis. However, it is not known where the helmet actually originated from. Another helmet that was widely used in Italy was the Attic helmet, which was similar to the Halkidian helmet but lacked a nose guard. An archaic hoplite also wore a 30 to 40 pound bronze breastplate called thorax and two greaves, or knemides that covered his shins to feet. Sometimes arm guards were also worn. The difficulty in moving in such weight would have been tremendous, especially if it rained or if the ground was sandy. 
Yet for all of its drawbacks, the bronze breastplate was incredibly effective at turning aside most blows, particularly those at close quarters. It would have been almost impossible to generate the amount of force necessary to penetrate it. A linothorax could also have been worn, probably by those of the lower middle class, as a substitute for the bronze armor, as it was a lower price. It was a breastplate made of linen that was divided into three parts a top piece, which covered the shoulders, a main piece that covers the torso that was kept in place by a leather or felt belt, and a row of metal flaps around the bottom that protected the groin and upper thigh. However, the extent to which it was used early on cannot be fully determined. It gained definitive popularity later in the armies of classical Greece and that of Alexander the Great, since such a lighter, cooler material would allow them to keep cool in hot, arid climates of Asia Minor and the Near East. Also, it would have increased mobility, especially as cavalry became more prominent. No example has survived from ancient times, though. Visual evidence is limited to vase paintings and sculptural reliefs. In any event, a hoplite was vulnerable above and under his breastplate, in the neck and groin. A hoplite's entire right side would also have been vulnerable as he was holding the shield in his left hand. However, his right side would have been protected by a fellow hoplite shield, which juts out to his left. Thus, a hoplite was never meant to fight alone. He only makes sense in a phalanx. Seen from the front, a phalanx presented a nearly solid wall of shields, helmeted heads, and spears. A hoplite had two offensive weapons at his disposal. His primary weapon was a wooden thrusting spear that was 6 to 8 feet in length, 2 to 4 pounds in weight, and 1 inch in diameter, called a duru. The spearhead was usually curved shaped. It was fitted with either a bronze or an iron butt on the other end that had a four-sided end spike, called a serrater. It protected the spear from rot when it was propped into the ground, but more importantly it was used to hit people with if the spear broke which happened often in the first three lines, since it was made out of wood. The spear was held in a hoplite's right hand, as his left hand was holding the shield. Its length allowed multiple ranks of formation to engage simultaneously during battle. A hoplite's secondary weapon was a short double-edged iron sword, called Zithos, kept at his waist on the left side. Some also carried a curved blade, called Copus, and it's no doubt that many hoplites also carried a dagger, or N. Heridion, as an extra insurance. Not everyone had the ability to fight as a hoplite, though, since they had to be able to pay for their equipment. Equipment was not standardized, and various forms of helmets and armor would continue to be experimented with over the succeeding centuries. For those who couldn't afford a full set of bronze armor, as described previously, they may have carried only a shield, a spear, and perhaps a helmet, plus a secondary weapon. It seems the shield was the key, since you had to be able to protect the person next to you. Since it didn't require custom fitting, like the armor, the shield may very well have been passed down from generation to generation. In any event, only those who could afford such weaponry fought as hoplites, and thus it was the middle classes who formed the bulk of the infantry. Modern estimates of those who did qualify vary considerably. Given the importance of the phalanx to the survival of the polis, and taking into consideration that captured armor could also be distributed, and that items of equipment could also be donated, a reasonable estimate is that at least half of the broad group of mesoi were able to serve. Thus, 60% or more of a typical hoplite army would have come from the non-noble families of the polis. Those too poor to be in the phalanx, however, still could participate in the army as light-armed troops, although only the hoplites had political rights in the state. They were broadly known as siloi, which literally means bare or stripped. They were armed with a variety of missile weapons, such as toxa, or bows, akontia, or javelins, and lithoi, stones, thrown from svendane, or slings. The problem, though, is that nobody had any range at this time. They had very poor bows and arrows that weren't strong enough to penetrate shields. They were useful, though, in picking off people who were retreating. There are grand archers in the Iliad, however, 
because the Iron Age armor wasn't as good as later times. For defense, the light infantrymen had no armor and usually no shield, but would be equipped with a dagger or a zithos. The Siloi were trained as skirmishers. Their task was to harass the enemy phalanx before the clash, to try to provoke disorder and protect their own lines from enemy skirmishers. They would be sent to occupy imposing terrain around and within the battlefield, as well as to disrupt the enemy in any way during his march, deployment, or encampment. Just before the charge of the line, the Siloi would be recalled through the phalanx and deployed behind it or on its wings. They would avoid close combat with more heavily armed opponents unless they had the advantage of especially favorable terrain. Naturally, the city-states differed in the organization and training of their military forces, and their skill and application of tactics. In fact, formal training in a weapons drill and unit formations seems to have been limited, and many citizens may have only had some kind of athletics training. The Spartans, however, were famous for their outstanding prowess in hoplite warfare, as they developed a society that allowed them to be essentially professional soldiers. We also know a lot about the Athenian army. There will be much more on both of them in upcoming episodes. In any event, the basic combat element of the Greek phalanx was the locus, or file, and ranged from 8 to 16 men. The file leader was called a lokagos. He is an officer roughly equivalent to that of a Roman centurion. So here is where things can be a little bit confusing. As we said before, the typical Greek phalanx was eight rows deep. It was made up of alternate ranks of protostates, which literally means the ones who stand in front, and epistates, or the ones who stand behind. Thus, in a file of eight men, the protostates were the men in positions 1, 3, 5, and 7, while the epistates occupied positions 2, 4, 6, and 8. The range of age of those serving in the army was from typically 20 to 45, although they were liable to serve until they were 60, in extreme emergencies. But since battles were likely to be seen every 2 to 3 years, the chances were high that most men would not make it to the age of 60 and would not die from natural causes. Furthermore, this meant that the phalanx was probably always made up of men in their mid to late 30s, who only needed to be physically fit enough to partake in one battle, not exhaustive campaigns, and they didn't need to be available non-stop for constant training. But it was literally a cross-section of the polis that marched out to fight, and this no doubt added to the camaraderie of the unit, as there was enormous psychological power in having all segments of society take part in the battle. Furthermore, the formation was deliberately organized to group friends and family closely together, thus providing a psychological incentive to support one's fellows, and a disincentive, through shame, to panic or to attempt to flee. The psychological fear that would have taken place in a hoplite battle would have been immense. All of these warriors were cramped into a tight place, where they probably couldn't even hear their own officers. Perhaps the slightest tremors or movements could be interpreted as the inevitable collapse of their position. The fear probably spread quickly backwards as any perceived setbacks could cause those to turn and run. Thus, the older men who weren't in their physical prime anymore, probably aged 35 to 45, were in the back because they knew the deal and wouldn't turn and run. The Oragos was the officer who kept order in the rear. The youngest, least experienced troops, aged 20 to 25, were in the middle so they had nowhere to run. In the other hand, you didn't want these inexperienced men in the front since they would have surely died. Thus the toughest, battle-hardened men in their prime were put up front, usually between the ages of 25 and 35, to ensure that their line wouldn't collapse. It was a badge of honor to say that you were in the front ranks. Since the phalanx often moved forward at a slight angle to the right, as men sought to keep behind the shield of their neighbor, this resulted in the left flank, usually breaking formation first. And so this was the flank a competent commander would attack with priority. He would therefore ensure he had his best troops on his own right flank. The general or commanding officer, referred to as the Polemarchus, was normally placed on the right and in the front right in the action. His role was to lead by example and fight alongside his soldiers. 
Thus, there was massive mortality rates for commanders, since he didn't have anybody to his right to protect him. Armies marched directly to their target, with the battlefield usually having been agreed upon by the contestants. Herodotus says that the Greeks chose the smoothest and best terrain available to pitch a battle, because that's what a phalanx needed. Trees, rivers, and hills would break up the solid formation and would have defeated the purpose of the phalanx. While the phalanx was very successful in the open field, the Greeks were not especially trained in siege warfare and only rarely were attacks against walled cities successful. The Greeks, though, fought each other over contestant land, most of the time, not foreigners. Armies in Greece generally didn't burn and pillage as they invaded as a war strategy, because it would have been extremely difficult to do so, as olive trees, for example, are incredibly difficult to cut down with simple hand holes. Also, the only time this strategy was remotely likely to succeed was during the harvest, but if Apollos' prime fighting men were out marching at this time, there would be nobody back home to bring in their harvest either. So it was very much the idea, not a practical fear, that nobody should be allowed to march through their polis, and that caused people to go out and fight the way that they did. Thus, the experience of battle was intended to be brief and decisive. Generally, hoplites only fought once per campaign season, or summertime. Before the battle started, each side conducted sacrifices, looking for favorable omens. Then the hoplites ate and drank plenty of wine. They tried to get to a certain level of inebriation in order to get that barroom mentality needed for battle, but not too much where it affected physical ability and mental wherewithal. The width of the line was always undetermined until the battle began. It had to be at least equal with the opponent so they didn't get outflanked. If you had less numbers, it affected how deep your lines could be. Cavalry was rarely used early on, and if it was, it was in order to protect the flanks and cover a possible retreat. As the battle began, at a signal from a trumpet, the soldiers charged in rhythm by the sound of a flute, called Aulus, and a battle hymn, called Paean. They advanced at a fast walk, or sometimes at a trot if they knew their enemy was prone to panic. The Greeks attacked on the move because keeping the phalanx moving in the same direction and with momentum was the most effective way to push through wooden shields and bronze armor. Also, it is harder to hit a moving object, because as they approached each other, archers on both sides would try and pick some off. Inevitably, those on the edges, not wanting to be outflanked and thus easily killed, always made slight turns to the right. The moment before the two sides collided would have been terrifying, as the thump of thousands of feet and the clinging of bronze would have made hearing impossible, and the dust kicking up in the hot Greek summer would have made vision just as difficult. In the instance before impact, alalagmoi, or war cries, would be made. We do not have much evidence on the specifics about these, though. The key to success for a hoplite battle was to create and exploit a hole in the enemy line. As the two sides neared each other, the first three lines would lower their spears into an underhand position, as shown on vase paintings and sculptures, trying to cause an injury to the enemy's groin area. The secondary lines would shift their spears to an overhead downward stabbing position at the semi-unprotected neck of their enemy. The back rows would keep their spears in an upright position to deflect any missiles that were still being thrown. As the opposing phalanxes met each other, an event called Croesus, those in the front line, called the Promakoi, would stab at their opponents, at the same time trying to keep in position. Those behind them would support them with their own spears and the mass of their shields gently pushing them, not to force them into the enemy formation, but to keep them steady and in place. The length of the spears kept the enemies at a distance, for now, but if the Doratismos, or spear combat, was not decisive, then the lines would close and swords would be drawn. The sword was always the second option, though. Many of these men would have also been accomplished or trained wrestlers, which assisted in their hand-to-hand -hand combat. If he couldn't kill his enemy, a hoplite also had a shield to push them back. 
If he succeeded, he would have an easy kill on the person to his right, whose left side is exposed, if the person behind doesn't come forward and fill the hole fast enough. The preceding rows would press up against the front to provide them with momentum going forward. At a certain point in the battle, probably after most spears had been broken, a command would be given for one side to take a certain number of steps forward and give the famed athesmos, a huge shove that attempted to knock down the front line of the enemy. This could be the longest phase of the battle. It was a coordinated effort aimed at creating fear and panic among the enemy ranks. If a huge gap were to happen in the ranks, the hoplites may become scared and retreat, but they had to drop their shields because it was hard to run with such a heavy object. He would then become a ripsaspis, or the one who threw his shield away. This was considered very disgraceful. The victors never pursued their enemies very far, because they didn't want to throw their shields away too, and that was the only way they could have caught up to them. A hoplite battle was a ferocious affair, and enormous courage was required of every single warrior, for success depended on every man holding his place in the formation. To flee the fight brought the contempt of the whole demos. Thus men stood their ground biting their lip with their teeth, as the Spartan poet Tertius puts it. The conditions of hoplite battles were awful. The equipment weighed about 70 pounds, and it was unbearably hot inside the armor. Vision was restricted by both the dust and the helmet. The noise was deafening. Everyone was splattered with blood. Wounded men were trampled underfoot. Tertius describes an old hoplite, breathing out his brave spirit in the dust, holding his bloody genitals in his hands. A gruesome picture for sure. These battles were fairly brief, however, and probably only lasted an hour or so. This has been theorized based on modern tests that have determined that hoplite warfare would have quickly exhausted both combatants, both physically and psychologically. Not much killing happened, though, until a phalanx was broken through, an event called pararexis. Then, the bulk of the killing occurred during the losing side's flight, as cavalry was deployed to mop up the scattered enemy. Some thought rationally, however, and tried to capture some of the fleeing men rather than kill them, in order to get a ransom. But men are very angry beings, especially in battle, so rational thought usually didn't win out for most men. Casualties could run as high as 15% to the losing side and around 5% for the victor. This is quite remarkable for an hour's worth of fighting, proving that hoplite battles were actually very bloody. However, most sources indicate that the majority of the wounds were not fatal, mostly being cuts to their extremities. The slain often included the most prominent citizens, though, since they were the ones who led from the front in order to achieve glory. The winners proved their victory by banging a stick in the ground and hanging some piece of a military equipment from their enemy. This would become known as a trophy, from the Greek verb trepho, meaning to turn, because the losers turned and ran away. The losers had to then humble themselves and ask for permission to bury their dead, which was usually granted. Proper burial was very critical in Greek religion. The Greeks believed that if a dead body wasn't buried, his shade would go on forever in unrest in Hades, and even come back to haunt those who failed to bury him. Afterwards, the victors were honored by their city, and those who ran away were shamed. Both sides, though, went back home to work their lands or practice their crafts, not to don their armor until the polis needed them again. It is in the hoplite army that we most clearly observe the polis ideology that the citizen is a slave of the common good. The poems of Tertius of Sparta and Callinus of Ephesus from around the mid-7th century BC reveal a shift in values from the individual to the polis. Although Homeric warriors faced death willingly as the price of their glory, they nevertheless saw it as an unmitigated evil. In Tertius, dying in battle had acquired a positive value, though. He writes, It is a noble thing for a good man to die, falling among the front ranks, fighting for his fatherland. He also says, Make life your enemy. 
and the black spirits of death, dear, as the rays of the sun. Bravery in battle was still the highest virtue, but it too had become a cooperative value. Not the heroics of individual champions, but simply keeping your place in the phalanx. Tertius writes, This is the common good. For the polis and the whole demos, when a man stands firm in the front ranks, without flinching, and puts disgraceful flight completely from his mind, making his soul and spirit endure, and with his words, encourages the man stationed next to him. Similarly, Honor, glory, and fame are sought just as eagerly by the citizen soldier as they were by the Homeric hero, but these could be earned only in service to the polis. Distinctions of wealth and birth vanished in the ranks of the phalanx. Kalinus writes, Though a man may have immortal gods as his ancestors, he is despised by the demos if he flees the thud of spears while the stout-hearted man who dies in battle is mourned by both the great and the small. In death, he is missed by the whole people, and in life, he is treated as a demigod. Tertius too shows how the hoplite ideal was eroding the Homeric notions of excellence that the nobles laid claim to as proof of their exclusive worth. He lists all the things that the Agathoi valued. Skill in athletics, strength and beauty, great wealth, political power, and eloquence in speaking, and says that he would not even mention in his poems a man that had every kind of fame except a fighting spirit. The reality of strict equality in the ranks, where nobles and non-nobles fought side by side, was making it increasingly difficult for the Agathoi to maintain their exclusivity and hold on political power. Already in Hesiod and Tertius, we see the growth of an anti-elitist ideology that challenged elitist pretensions of natural superiority and believed that non-nobles were equal to nobles off the field of battle as well as on. Throughout the archaic and classical periods, the non-noble hoplites would play a key role as the independent variable in the power relations and within the polis. This class comprising fairly well-off farmers and craftsmen, was the pivotal group in determining where a polis stood on the political continuum from narrow oligarchies to full democracies. If they were content with an uneven distribution of power and agreed to the exploitation of the weak, oligarchical regimes reigned secure. If, on the other hand, they opposed the status quo and sympathized with the bottom half of the citizenry, the balance of power shifted from the elite to the mass. Because the well-off farmers tended towards conservatism, most polis in the archaic and classical periods were moderately oligarchical, granting citizen rights in accordance with economic status. But in those polis where the upper level of the mesoi came down firmly on the side of the poor, there was complete legal and political equality between the classes. The rapid swings from oligarchy to democracy, and vice versa, that occurred so frequently in the history of a polis are best explained by the shifts in attitude of the non-noble hoplites. They also played a major role in the political phenomenon the Greeks called tyrannus, or tyranny, of which we will cover in depth in future episodes. An 8th century BC inscription from the island of Chios talks about a town council called a bule he demosia, meaning a council for the people. The word demos is at the root. It was still a noble council, however, but these new independent agrarians, who now had a title to their land, owned slaves and fought in the infantry as the core of the army, were now the backbone of the polis, so they demanded a larger voice in government. Results of inclusion differed within each polis, Sometimes the old nobility held on for a very long time. In other places, these dissatisfied soldiers would latch on to particular noblemen who promised them things and engaged in a revolution to get him solo power, called a tyranny. After tyranny was removed in that polis, it would never return again. The polis then reverted back to an oligarchy, but this time it was dictated by wealth and not birth, which allowed for social mobility into politics. This was the most characteristic form of government. Athens, 
with their democracy, was the exception. The only large-scale war on the Greek record, after the mythical Trojan War and the Persian War, that involved alliances of cities as opposed to individual tribes in conflict, was fought between Lefkandi's Euboean neighbors, Halkis and Eretria. Ancient authors referred to it as the war between Halkidians and Eretrians, but modern scholars call it the Lelantine War because it was fought over the domination of the fertile Lelantine Plain which lays between the two cities. It occurred sometime between 725 and 650 BC, but we have no direct information in the ancient sources to date this war. The foundation stories of the joint euboean phoenician trading post at Ischia suggest that in the mid-8th century BC, Halkis and Eretria were cooperating. Nevertheless, it remains unclear why Halkis and Eretria suddenly came to blows over the Lelantine Plain after apparently being in agreement on its use for a long time. The origin of conflict could be connected to a natural disaster. It is believed that at the end of the 8th century BC, Attica, Euboea, and other nearby islands suffered from a severe drought, which would have brought on famine as a consequence. If this is true, it is possible that this led to the conflict. In Greece, where fertile land is scarce, Wars for agriculturally attractive terrain, especially in times of famine, were not uncommon. In any event, regardless of the cause for war, while both cities possessed large fleets, this war was mostly fought on land and demonstrated the first use of the hoplite phalanx warfare, on the historical record at least. However, we are not sure what phase of the phalanx's development was being employed, It probably was not as described earlier in this episode, and was more likely a transitional time between the Homeric way of fighting and the classical hoplite phalanx. Eretria was said to have fielded 3,000 hoplites, 600 cavalry, and 60 chariots. The size and number of Hawkus' forces are unknown. We only know that their infantry was superior and their cavalry was inferior to that of Eretria. From these two initial Euboean combatants, the Lelantine War grew through a series of personal alliances between states. At the time of the war, the state of Eretria included one quarter of the island of Euboea, as well as the nearby Cyclades islands of Andros, Tenos, and Chia. The expansion of the conflict into other regions and the number of allies are disputed. According to Herodotus, Miletus participated on the side of Eretria and Samos and Thessaly on that of Halkis. Beyond these, the alliances between archaic Greek states, known from other sources, have led to further suggestions of parties involved, leading some scholars to propose up to 40 participants. Such numbers would, however, imply broad-ranging political alliance systems, which the majority of scholars do not consider likely for the 8th century BC. Even if many other cities were involved in warfare at the same time, It cannot, however, be argued that every conflict between Greek states of the time was part of this war. It is possible that dozens of other Greek cities were involved, many of which used this conflict to resolve their own territorial disputes, and which could have resulted in spin-offs in Asia Minor and Italy, due to Euboea's sphere of influence from colonization. Most scholars assume that, apart from the cities mentioned above, only Agena, Corinth, Megara, Chios and Erythrae took place in the Lelantine War proper. The island of Agina was active in trade with Egypt, and its major competitor was Samos. Samos was allied with Halkis, which suggests that Agina took the side of Eretria. Corinth and Megara were at war for practically all of the Archaic period, primarily because of the Corinthian conquest of the Parahora Peninsula which was the land on the other side of the Isthmus of Corinth that had originally belonged to Megara. The actions of Halkis and Corinth in the context of Western colonization suggest that the two cities were allied, or at least friendly. Halkis had prevented Megarian settlers from establishing themselves at Leontini in Sicily, while Corinth had driven Eretrian settlers from the island of Corsaira. Thus, a friendship between Megara and Eretria is assumed. Herodotus reports that Chios supported Miletus in the Ionian revolts, 
that eventually led to the Persian War. More on that later. Because Miletus had previously assisted the Chiots against Erythrae in Asia Minor. Thus, based on the allegiance of Miletus, an alliance between Chios and Eretria, as well as one between Erythrae and Chalcis, can be suggested. Archaeological evidence shows that around 700 BC, Lefkandi was destroyed, probably by Chalcis, because it would have cut Eretria's link to the Lelantine Plain. At about the same time, Eretria's ally Miletus ravaged the southern Nubian town of Keristos. Relevant lines from the poet Archilochus, who is usually thought to have died around 650 BC, indicate that the war was still ongoing through his time. So it is possible that the conflict was subdivided into several phases of warfare and ceasefire, as were the later Mycenaean and Peloponnesian Wars. In any event, according to Plutarch, the war may have been concluded, in favor of Hawkus, by the intervention of a Thessalian cavalry army led by Cleomachos, a Pharsalus, although it is not entirely clear whether the event in question decided the war, or indeed whether Hawkus definitely won it. Regardless, following the war, the two initial combatants were exhausted to the point that the island of Euboea soon became a Greek backwater. Eretria and Halkis had lost their former economic and political importance. Halkis entered a long decline, while the islands in the Cyclades that Eretria controlled earlier seemed to have become independent. It was left to other cities, most notably in Miletus and Corinth to shoulder the burden of further archaic Greek cultural development. On the Mediterranean markets, Corinthian vase painting had taken over the dominant role previously occupied by Euboean pottery. The leading role in colonization was taken over by the polis of Asia Minor, such as Miletus in the east and Phokia in the west. But before we get there, let's circle back and discuss in detail the Greek emigration throughout the Mediterranean that we have been alluding to in the last several episodes. After the establishment of Pithecusae and Cumae, the Greeks poured into southern Italy and Sicily in such large numbers that it became known as Magna Graecia, or Great Greece. Trading colonies were also established in Spain, France, Corsica, and Sardinia that would ultimately bring them into conflict with the two premier powers of the Western Mediterranean at that time, the Etruscans and the Carthaginians. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 14, Colonization in the West. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I would also like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Mount Olympus from his album The Ancient Greek Lyre. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.